it's a pleasure to be back at Rusi and to be talking on such a, an important issue. We live in a, in a new world, a world of interdependence, where risk in one part of the globe quickly spreads to the rest. Contagion, whether it's economic, such as the 2008 banking crisis, natural, such as SARS, or terrorist, such as 9-11, will ricochet around the globe. As I said in my own book, Rising Tides, if Francis Fukuyama had called his book the end of geography rather than the end of history, he'd been much closer to the mark. And nowhere has the rate of change been greater than in the world of communications technology. Uh, Bill Clinton put it very concisely when he said that when I took office, only high-energy physicists had ever heard of what is called the World Wide Web. Now even my cat Socks has its own page. And it's astonishing to think that in the middle of 1993, there were a total of 130, 130 websites in the world. By the end of 2014, this had risen to well over 950 million. And to put things in context, at the end of 1995, during President Clinton's first term, around 16 million people, or 0.5% of the global population, were using the internet. And by the end of 2012, this had risen to 2.75 billion, or around 40% of the global population. So today, I want to talk about some of the new threats that we face as a result of these changes and some of the new ways of thinking that we need to incorporate as a result. Of course, in the wider context, and I know that Rusia are going to do some work on this soon, we need to consider not only what is conventionally seen as cyberspace, but also the information elements involved in hybrid warfare. However, time today only allows me to deal with the former. I recently spoke in Switzerland in Lugano to Swiss bankers, where I was surprised by the huge variation in understanding of the potential cyber threats they were facing and the apparent lack of urgency in dealing with them. And as I pointed out, the first thing we have to learn about this new world is that we cannot disaggregate risk in the way that we might have been able to do in the past. Our dependence on new communications technology and the vulnerability that it brings has added new risk to the mix. As we've become dependent on technology to lubricate the wheels of our everyday activities, so we have become more vulnerable to either the failures of the technologies themselves or our ability to access them. We are being drawn inexorably into the era of the war of the invisible enemy. And this is not the Cold War, where individual spies smuggled small pieces of information to the Soviet handlers in London clubs or Viennese cafes. Nowadays, we can have the vast theft of electronic material by traitors like Snowden, who massively compromised his country's national security and ours, and then jumped on a plane to Hong Kong and Moscow. Technology gives advantages, but also potential weaknesses. And when the Chinese shot down one of their own satellites in space, it wasn't to show themselves that they were capable of doing it. It was to show the rest of us. The naval fleets of the West may be advanced and powerful, but not if they don't know where they are and how many of them can navigate by sextant. The Chinese in particular are spearheading a new approach to security, which is not necessarily to match our military capabilities, like for like, but to deny us access to our own defence capacity. It's against that background that we need to consider the whole range of cyber vulnerabilities. Although we talk about cyber crime, cyber espionage and cyber warfare as being separate entities, they are in fact part of a continuum and just as we cannot disaggregate some of the risks I mentioned earlier, so we cannot draw clear distinctions between different types of cyber threats, however much the structure of Whitehall encourages us to pigeonhole them. Now, it's an old adage that crime doesn't pay, but we all know that some crimes pay better than others. Cybercrime has at least three elements which make it more attractive. It is generally low risk but high return, it largely has the advantage of anonymity, and it often goes unreported. And while estimates of the cost of cybercrime vary, it's thought that the annual global bill runs to somewhere between hundreds of billions and the low trillions of dollars. Contrary to the image so often portrayed in our newspapers and broadcast media, cybercriminals are not typically the sad, geeky teenagers trying to impress others with their ability to hack into big organisations but veritable armies of terrorists, agents of hostile states, and drug cartels. They use fraud and extortion to fund their activities and do so on a truly industrial scale. 
So the first lesson I want to leave with you today is that those who leave themselves vulnerable to these activities make themselves part of a national security threat, usually as a result of lack of diligence or a lack of understanding. We've held, heard a great deal in recent times about the concept of denial of service attack, where information overload results in the inability of a company or an organization to continue with normal function and serve its customers. Yet what is less well known is that these denial of service attacks are very often a smokescreen used by cyber criminals to perform a secondary crime. For example, the confusion caused by the attack may be used as an opportunity to implant malware into the system, which can subsequently be used to extort ransom by threatening to cripple the system itself. And Nokia were a well-known recent example of such an attack, where blackmailers successfully persuaded the company to part with a suitcase containing millions of dollars in exchange for a crucial small piece of smartphone software. And when the victims do not accede to the criminal's requests, they may find that their system's data is wiped, their files are encrypted to the point of becoming useless, or the information in their customer base may be used and misused often in subsequent financial crime. Attacks may come from outside or inside any organization. Those who have been subjected to high-profile attacks in recent times range from the U.S. Army to TripAdvisor. In 2014, those of you who are involved in the industry will know that the banking giant J.P. Morgan had cyber criminals sitting on their servers for over two months before being detected, and around 76 million personal accounts were compromised, along with 7 million business accounts. I've already mentioned Edward Snowden, who compromised the national security of his country and its allies from inside the U.S. security architecture. But cybercrime can be profitable in some unexpected areas. Healthcare is a case in point where attention to patient care often leaves information security as a secondary issue. In the US in particular, healthcare mergers have often left multiple IT systems running a single hospital. And although there have been no reported hacks at the NHS, you'll be pleased to know, it's currently facing more than £1.3 million in fines for compromised data. Now, why does this matter? Last year in the US, the health records of over 100 million people were hacked, a hundred times more than any, any one previous year. It's thought that many of the attacks originated in China, where the Chinese government's cleaned to find out how medical insurance databases operate so that they can construct similar systems of their own. But there is, of course, the possibility of such data being collected for intelligence and espionage purposes, and US authorities are increasingly concerned about what may be a potential threat to national security. So just out of interest, how much do you think your healthcare records are worth on the market? Well, it's sobering to note that your credit card details can be bought for about a dollar a time on the dark net, but your medical records are far more likely to attract a price of up to $2,000 per time. And you can think through, in a lot of individuals' cases, why that might be the case. Now, probably the difference... The best difference between cybercrime and cyber espionage is that in the latter, the aim is not to make monetary gain through a ransom, but to gain information. Now, often this will involve a strategy of remaining undetected in order to gain proprietary knowledge, understanding of the business strategy, or details of IP development. And in the defense sector, you can quickly understand the importance of that. Now, this can be done in a number of ways and generally exploits gaps in security where business is being done in the way it has always been done. A very good example of this is during the process of mergers and acquisitions, where potential partners have unparalleled access to staff and communications details and are able to exploit this to their own benefit. And the ability during this period to insert spyware, which can potentially stay undetected for a long period of time, is a major weakness in the cybersecurity of many companies. And given that you can actually get such spyware for around $250, on the dark web, it can be an enormous temptation to the unscrupulous. Another major weakness is the failure of companies to properly security clear the most junior staff, especially those such as cleaners. Not only are these likely to be the lowest paid employees and therefore the most susceptible to modest financial inducements from outside, but they will often have access to premises when they're otherwise empty. A few minutes while they clean an office or a room can be enough time to insert a USB into a computer port and infect the system with malware, especially where employees add to the risk 
by leaving their computers on while simply switching off their monitors. And how many of us could honestly put our hands up and say we've never been guilty of that particular piece of negligence? Indeed. A more traditional James Bond style of cyber espionage is the classic honey trap. Despite what the public are likely to believe, uh, secrets are much more likely to be betrayed impressing people over a cocktail than in the bedroom. And it's very easy for information to spill out. However, there are far more subtle ways to achieve the same effect. When someone asks you at a reception if they can use your mobile phone to make a quick call because they've left theirs at home, think twice. Likewise, when someone offers you the use of their laptop or tablet to access your email account or even asks for your password, it may be the key to opening up vast amounts of data you don't want them to have. And even more likely than these two methods of cyber espionage is the voluntary exposure uh, induced by employees when they access social media through their work computers, mobiles or tablets. And it can provide a gateway to a huge array of information and networks and contacts that can provide invaluable to competitors, saboteurs or enemies. Now, activities such as these will not be confined to those who operate in the same business base, but in the case of China, for example, represents hacking on an industrial scale in an attempt to gain access to market information that might prove valuable at a national level. And neither is it only small companies that are likely to be targeted. A hack known as Titan Rain, believed to have been the work of Chinese groups starting in 2003-04 as an attempt at corporate espionage, lifting sensitive information from networks of major U.S. defense contractors, including those at Lockheed Martin, Sandia National Laboratories, Redstone, Arsenal, and NASA, then spread in 2005-06 to involve the networks of both the U.S. Department of Defense and our own MOD. The MOD naturally have always declined to say whether our systems were compromised, but it's believed that the same attack managed to take down the House of Commons computer systems for almost a full day in 2006. And although the MOD um, found that the hacks originated in China, they've declined, of course, to link them directly to the Chinese government or the People's Liberation Army. It's an example of how the line is blurred between corporate and state cyber espionage. Two other uh, attacks are worthy of note for different reasons. During March and April 2014, the US Office of Personnel Management was subject to one of the largest personal data breaches in history. For over a month, an as yet unknown group of hackers siphoned off the personal data of over 21 million US civil service employees, including names, addresses, and security numbers more than enough to clone their identities. But I think the most arresting aspect of this breach was the theft of 5.6 million sets of fingerprints from the department. And for the first time, cybercrime had been used to steal not only a person's legal and financial identity, but part of their physical identity as well. And of course, the example that most people will be aware of, because it relates to the media, uh, and celebrities, is the 2014 hack of Sony Pictures Entertainment. Of course, there's nothing uh, to stimulate media attention like stories about the media. Sony Pictures were hacked in the run-up to the release of their film, The Interview, which, if you've seen it, was about two American reporters travelling to North Korea to assassinate Kim Jong-un. A group calling itself the Guardians of Peace appropriated the private information of employees and their families, internal company emails, and footage from unreleased films, and unsurprisingly, the finger pointed straight at North Korea. Now, all this matters in security, but let me turn more uh, particularly to the third element, cyber terrorism and warfare. Now, traditional warfare is costly in both human and financial terms, so there's a constant incentive to find alternative ways of achieving the same end. The high-altitude spy planes of the Cold War have given way to UAVs or drones that have themselves evolved from purely information gathering to having attack capability. And of course, in recent years, they have been used extensively in Iraq and in the mountains of Pakistan and of Afghanistan. Now, the first point to make about cyber warfare is that it's not necessarily about matching capability. As I said, the Chinese in particular do not invest vast sums trying to recreate America's conventional capability, although their defense budget has risen massively in recent years. But they are intent on developing systems that will deny America and its allies access to their own systems and capabilities. But it's just worth pointing out 
to uh, the media here that the US defence budget is still the size of the next 11 biggest in the world combined. Be careful who your friends are and who they're not. The whole concept of cyber warfare is based upon the ability to bring developed rivals who are hugely dependent on advanced technology to their knees by dying, denying them IT capability. This can happen across financial systems, across telecommunications, or even, as I said, in healthcare. But perhaps most worryingly is the effort being put into the disruption of critical national infrastructure, such as power generation and transmission. And it's known that terror groups in countries such as Pakistan, Iran, Syria, and Kenya have in recent times been recruiting IT experts in these areas with the specific aim of developing these capabilities. And terror groups have been increasingly involved in projects to make drones ineffective, or worse, to turn them around and send them back to return fire on their senders, the so-called return to sender concept. In Syria, a group known as Project Viridian have been able to take out the Syrian stock exchange with huge knock-on financial impacts, one of the reasons I believe the Syrians are not exactly unhappy having the Russians on board. In Iran, a group known as Paris2 has not only been recruiting IT experts with knowledge of financial markets and electricity transmission, but has already been linked to an attack on an electric substation in California on April the 16th, 2013. It would be extremely naive to believe that we can expect anything other than a lot more of the same. So what can be done about this vast array of problems? There's understandably a great deal of commercial activity linked to dealing with yesterday's threats, and it's no more than common sense to install antiviral software in our computers. But we would be wise not to put too much faith in this as a means of protecting us from future threats. As I've already mentioned, it's worth paying particular attention to staff. 80%, 80% of malicious attacks on companies come from inside their own organisation. And in any organisation serious about cyber security, all staff need to be screened, from the more senior executives right down to the janitors and cleaners. The more senior the staff, the greater the, and the greater their access to sensitive information, the deeper the screening needs to be, including physical as well as digital checks. And just as important is the education of staff in relation to the portals they handle on a daily basis, mobile phones, tablets, and computers. They need to be made to understand that this is company property and that to leave it exposed and vulnerable, either by intent or carelessness, is a serious and possibly sackable offence. In particular, they must understand that social media can act as a Trojan horse, allowing threats from the outside to easily gain access to complex data about their organisation with potentially devastating consequences. And another area which needs to be considered is the security of business and supply chains. Those involved in cybercrime or espionage in particular will be looking to find the weakest link as a way into a wider system and minimum standards of cyber security need to be applied not just at the highest level in any business chain, but throughout. Now, some companies have developed ethical hacking services, such as KCS in the UK. These can enable companies to test cyber security in real time and to determine weaknesses that they may not have previously perceived. Uh, this company have developed a program known as Glasswall, which is able to track the movements of documents within an organisation, detailing from the outset who had access to them and what they did with them and for how long. And to give you just one example of how this can be used, in a recent test of the company's Sentinel program, they found that a desktop had been disconnected from the server for just a few minutes and a removable drive had been inserted. And this was a company just asking them to check what their security was like. And as a result, they were able to identify that 2,000 files had been copied by an employee who had already resigned and was intent on taking up a post with a rival company, taking all the information with him. And had the company not simply been curious about what could be done, they would never have known. Now, all of this has huge implications at a national security level. One of the major challenges we have is the need to persuade both the public and the military that we need to spend more on the invisible technology that will protect us from some of the threats I've described. In a finite budget environment, this may mean that we will have to disinvest in some of the things that we can see, 
our traditional military capabilities so that we can invest in things that we cannot see, i.e. cyber capabilities. The alternative, of course, and the much more rational and sensible course is an increase in overall security spending, although this is a hard sell in democratic countries which have become addicted to welfare provision and take security for granted. We also need to develop proper cyber doctrine in the way that we did in the emergence of the nuclear era. We need to determine how we would respond to potential existential threats and how we would use asymmetry to both deter and, if necessary, deal with cyber aggression. And there are two other areas for change that I would propose. The first is legislative. The second is organisational. I believe that the law needs to change in two major ways. As I mentioned earlier, denial of cyber intrusion is too often the response of companies worried about their reputation. It didn't happen to us. This encourages entirely the wrong culture. If the fund holding my pension is being hacked and my money is being lost, I want to know about it. That's why I believe the government needs to change the law to make it illegal to be hacked without informing shareholders and other stakeholders. The second change I believe we need is in relation to those who do business with government. As I've already pointed out, it's much easier to penetrate a small company in a supply chain than a major organisation such as the MOD. That's why I believe the government should insist, by legislation, that any, that any organisation that does business with government should have a minimum defined level of cyber security or they will be excluded from government contracts. It's the only way to keep us safe. And the final change refers to the structure of government itself. I believe that the current structure of Whitehall and the way that our cyber security is arranged is outdated, too complex, and is an inefficient way of using taxpayers' money. I would like to see all government cyber activity, including, including both its offensive and defensive capabilities, concentrated in one place and answerable to a single ministerial portfolio. We cannot afford either the luxury or risk of unnecessary duplication and diversion of scarce resources, not to mention the misplacement of the vital but finite number of individuals with the necessary skills to carry out these tasks. The task of responsible politicians is to ask today the questions that the public would ask the day after a major security breach. Asking these questions may not make the front pages when we ask them, but our challenge is surely to make sure that they never do. Thank you.